Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Eric Davis. You are listening to the EvoSec podcast. I am one half of the Tactical Twins. Aaron is still recovering from his surgery, but he's going to be back real soon and really appreciates all the well wishes. So thanks for that. What I will say is that I am joined by um, a few guys becoming known as the Range Master Chess Club. Am I correct, guys, in that? Yes, sir. <laughs> I I think that's a I think that's an accurate description of you guys. Um, you you guys definitely bring the intelligence <laughs> and uh, and and really an awesome group of guys. So I think that's a good title for you guys. But anyway, I've got John Hearn of Two Pillars Training, Lee Weems of First Person Safety, and Eric Gilhouse of Cougar Mountain Solutions. Guys, welcome to the show. It's awesome to have all three of you on the show. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks for having us. It's nice to be back. So let's do a quick, you know, we don't have to go into to huge details because I'm going to point everybody back to previous shows that we've had all three of you guys on. But Eric, let's just go ahead and start with you. Give us a summary of your bio, buddy. So Eric Gillhouse from out on the West Coast. I uh, did a full career in law enforcement and a lot of what that entails, patrol investigations, gang suppression, being a teacher in the office, some other things. Uh, former military, both the Cold War and the Global War on Terror. Started teaching a gun sight in 2000 after I've been there a student for a few years. Um, when retirement hit, I hung up my own signal. I've uh, been doing some writing, went to grad school, which is probably where the nerd side of me like completely came into view. Um, and been fortunate enough to look for John and Lee to let me hang around with them. Cool, cool. Well, you know, I'm sure that they appreciate your company for certain and what you bring to the table. <laughs> I'm sure we're going to get into a little bit of jabbing here shortly. I I, I feel it coming. Um, John, go ahead and uh, give us a bio, buddy. John Hearn uh, started in law enforcement in 1992. Got uh, picked up a master's degree along the way. Thought I was going to go on and actually get a PhD as a career, do the law enforcement thing on a part time basis. Found out that I really enjoyed uh, working with law enforcement. Um, I have been a staff instructor with Range Master and Tom Givens since 2001, and I'm in the third year of having my own company called uh, Two Pillars Training. Uh, the two pillars are basically uh, peer-reviewed scientific research, as well as real-world best practices, trying to bring those two things together and maybe offer some other, th maybe uh, produce some offerings that aren't commonly seen in the training world right now. Yeah, some of your lectures are, man, phenomenal. You know, we can hit on a little bit of that for certain. Um, folks need to to get out and, and train with all three of these gentlemen. Well, well Lee, um, give us a quick bio, buddy. Uh, Lee Weems. I live in the state of Georgia, and I am, I've am i been a peace officer for 24 years. Uh, along the way, I picked up a master's degree, and I work part-time as a college professor teaching various political science topics. Uh, I'm one of those rare, rare beings indeed, and that I was a gun guy that got put in charge of an agency for a while. And I spent 12 years as chief deputy, and I've uh, finally got paroled, and I'm a recovering administrator now. And uh, spend all of my time a full time trainer on the law enforcement side, in addition to the college stuff part time. And then I'm a staff instructor, uh, along with John for Range Master. I'm one of Dave Spalding's handgun combative certified instructors, and I have my own business of first person safety. Well, and and again, that is how I really ran into all three of you guys, at least starting online and. And then, of course, in person, you know, Eric was in my uh, Range Master IDC, my first IDC class. And and then, of course, just finally got to meet Lee and John at Range Master TACCON 23. What a phenomenal time, guys. It was it was awesome to to finally meet you, John and 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 Lee. And, of course, train with all three of you. It was a, an amazing time. Of course, we've done an AAR on here, and, and you guys have as well. Man, just a incredible time. I have to say I'm disappointed it's 
it's looking like I'm not going to be able to make it to um, to 24, but but Aaron and I will be certainly in 25. But uh, I, I think it's important that that folks that are in this walk, man, they need to they need to go to events like TatCon. I, I mean, it was our first TatCon, and I've been knowing about TatCon for for years. So, you know, and, and some of it was trying to get into events in the past and I would be deployed or I would have something going on work wise. It just didn't work out, but it, it delivered beyond anything that, that we really anticipate. I and mean, we knew it was going to be awesome, but man, what a, what a great time. So it was awesome to, to be there with you guys. And you guys, again, brought awesome instruction, I mean, I still got a ton of notes and, and you may, you guys may recall, we did a, did, did a breakdown of some of your guys' lectures as well. Now, with that said, without me bloviating on, um, you're so, not bloviating. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so I invited you guys on because you guys just had your inaugural cognitive conclave and and i've read some reviews you again i mentioned before you guys did and a, a similar rundown of the course um just this last week right wasn't it lee mm -hmm. this last week yeah. so um for folks in the audience it's the 24th of may and real quick while i'm thinking about uh, a shout out and a simplify to my son um nick davis um it's his 23rd birthday today happy birthday son um, but, but yeah, it, it was a, it was a good rundown for certain. So I'm going to put that in the show notes as well. So can you guys, um, can one of you guys take, what is a conclave? I, I have my definition. I'm, I'm curious what, what your guys definition as it relates to, um, your event. I'll, I'll let any of you guys take that. When I was trying to come up with a name for the event. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was trying to come up with something, one that would be catchy and that would be unique and everything. And I just got to searching around and, you know, a conclave is the gathering of cardinals. Yeah. You know, to everything. And I thought we are the cardinals of cognition. And so that's where I, I just kind of, kind of thought that was funny. And so I called it the, uh, the cognitive conclave. Well, well, Lee, you know, to be honest with you, that's, I mean, very similar, but I mean, that's nearly verbatim what I had in my head was your guy's choice in that because it, it, it seemed to fit you guys. And, and I was tracking that it was a gathering of the, the Cardinals typically to vote for the Pope in many cases or make um, high level decisions. Right. Yeah. Well, the I also put, I think the name was also important to, to, to distinguish <laughs> right. it from I just other stuff. It's, you know, it's not necessarily a class per se. It was an experience as we talk over each other here. We may have to institute the hand weight raising really fast. <laughs> Eric, I think you're going to have to call on someone specifically. Yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm going to do that from now on. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, so, so Eric, you were going to say something though, and I'll come back to John about his comment. Well, John was actually putting out good information. I was going to say we apparently elected Steve as the Pope of Georgia as a result of this. <laughs> that would be the magnificent Steve. Uh, we should have had him on very, as well, to be frank. You uh, know. Steve Havey is a very dear friend. He's been very pivotal in uh, the growth of my business. And I, I would jokingly refer to him as the director of engineering. Is, is his official title in our organization. And um, he makes a lot of the behind-the-scenes behind stuff happen. He comes up with apparatuses or apparati, however you want to say it. Apparati. You, apparati. you guys taught me a new word with apparati the other evening. <laughs> and, yeah. and I like to think that I have a, have a pretty decent vocabulary, but I hadn't heard that one. Yeah, he, he comes up with lots of great things. Uh, he... he you know, when class shows up and Steve like remembers all their, their names and everything. Like I come up with my own names for them 
in my brain so I can separate them. Steve actually knows their names. And like, we'll be at dinner after a class or riding back home and saying, he'll start talking about somebody and something in their life story or whatever. Like, who? Yeah. The guy <laughs> third from the left on the, you know, and he, and he's, he's just such a great people person and um, not enough good things can be said about him. Well, very true. I, 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 th- I think I think we need to have him on the show. I, I, you know, of course, I've been hearing about him on your show, and he sounds like an outstanding guy. I should have I should have thought better and made sure that that we invited him on as well. Um, and you speak of the name, the name thing, the name game, as as I think Craig calls it. That's something that always impressed me about Craig Douglas. Man, he at, at least midway in the class, he knows everybody's name. And, and in our classes, I'm trying to get better at that. Um, but that's, that's, that's difficult. I so. do okay for the duration of the class, but after a dinner the last night, it's usually a brain dump. <laughs> and I'll remember you. I'll remember what I had you in class, but it's not your name. Sorry. <laughs> I suck. I mean, we, we're all, we're all different humans, you know, well, well guys real quick. So, as I was thinking about how to to talk about the cognitive conclave, is I I kind of thought about number one. There's a lot of classes. All of us have been to them. You know where you're, you know you're learning to run the gun. You know, and those classes are important. Um, but we we all know that that there's only so far you need to take that. Of course, we want to. Um, get to where we have automaticity to, to use a, a very popular word. John Hearn has, has um, put into our brains um, that automaticity is important, but, but John, it, isn't it one of the things that you said at range master was that probably about B class USPSA, you, you're, you're likely shooting good enough, right? Yeah. The, several people have made that point. John Hoshin, who we have, uh, an infinite amount of respect for. Oh, uh, yeah. I said at some point you shoot good enough and you need to be worried about other things. And um, as somebody who's pursued shooting excellence, it was, it was disconcerting to talk to somebody who's a legitimate PhD in the field and find out that apparently I've wasted a lot of my adult life. Um, you know, Jeff Cooper called them uh, a preoccupation with insignificant increments. You know, if your bill drills a 2.0 or 2.05, uh, in some worlds, that makes all the difference in the world. You know, it earns you certain titles, but for most of us, you know, a three-second build drill out of realistic carry gear is, you know, perfectly acceptable and, and solid work. So I think at some point you shoot good enough, and we have to start um, applying those skills in a uh, either in the context in which they'll be used, or add add unnatural stressors to those to see how well they actually do hold up. Um, I think one of the things we all observed is that when we started putting people under cognitive load, people who were very solid shooters who we had shot with had had classes before, I, I think we all saw degradation in performance that you probably wouldn't have gotten in a conventional venue because they're used to being able to perform in that classroom environment. It's no longer a novel experience for them. And when they have to think and engage in other tasks, it becomes very telling. Yeah, and that, that's kind of what I thought about when when I was like, what, how do I want to to guide this since I'm not an attendee of the of the course? Now that that will change the 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 moment that I can get into it. Hopefully, the next time you guys do it. Um, but you know, to me, it's about pressure testing beyond the actual learning the skills and running the gun you know, automaticity, being able to, to, to run the pistol well or the rifle or the shotgun, but then you've got to be under some form of pressure testing. And in my opinion, you got to be in, under pressure testing on a decent, uh, you know, amount of time throughout the year. That's just my thought process in it. But to me, there's two ways of, of pressure testing. Obviously, there's simulation through simunitions, UTM marking cartridges, um, you know, scenario based training evos like with DCQC and Shiv Works and and the collective guys. And then to me, there's this. I know it's not novel, but I still think that from what I've seen in the industry, this type of cognitive 
cognitive loading during this type of, of a course it is still a little bit in its infancy. Am I wrong in that? Other than, you know, I know stuff like this has been going on a while, but I, I mean, I just don't see that many courses available like what you guys, the experience that you're talking about. So, so I, I guess what I'm getting at is, is that to me, this is a way for folks that are not into, they're not, they're not wanting to get shot with Sims and go through all that pressure of, you know, the pain and the peer pressure of being embarrassed, all that. Of course, in my opinion, you can be embarrassed in, in a cognitive load course, but maybe this is another gateway Lee, why don't you talk about that? Is is this another pressure testing method and maybe a gateway, you know, where folks can try to learn how to think with a gun in their hand? Yeah, and that's how we we kind of build the experience and advertise it as we were talking talking it up. And it was one of the things we we kept trying to stress is don't be afraid to fail or don't let the fear of failure keep you away from this. This is where you're supposed to fail. If you're going to, is to, is to do it in training, learn what your limits are or learn that you can perform and maybe it'll free up uh, and, and, and free your mind from some of that anxiety. And I always wondered would I actually be able to see my sights in a stressful event. And I went to a very, very rigorous force on force class uh, through Fletzy several years ago. And, you know, with past fail scenarios where you, you get sent home, if you fail uh, type pressure, I was able to see sites and, and make decisions. And I came away from that class going, all right, I know I'm good. You know, if, if the chips are down, I know I'll be able to perform. And I know it was all scenarios and I knew I wasn't really going to die. But you know the the feel of fear of failure is a big thing, and I think that's 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 worse than actual fear. Well, well and I think the 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 late great um, William April, Doctor William April, um, said it in many ways and many times that you know our brain really cannot tell the difference between um, foe stress and real stress, at least. Um, and and certainly John Hearn, this is one of his areas of expertise as well. But to me, I, I think every time we we put ourselves under real or excuse me, novel stress, no matter what form mm -hmm. it is, I mean, it, it it's it could be as something as 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 simple as you know, again, scenarios and simunitions in a a situation where a you're you're at I don't know the 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 obligatory parking lot scenario you know no matter how that situation goes you have a parking spot for that in your brain and the very fact of these methods that you guys are using in the class which i'd like to whatever kind of details you guys want to give is that you are you're having a person go through a stressful event and they've been through that stress before and it's going to help them if they face real stress on the street, right? Again, Lee. Yeah, I think that is a big deal. Uh, it's one thing to stand in front of a two-dimensional piece of paper or cardboard. That's just standing there and you preload the motor program that you're going to exercise when you get the stimulus, which is usually a whistle or a beep or whatever. And that's typically, you're not going to be getting an audible stimulus uh, to, to start action in a real life scenario. And you, you just load all those programs up and then it's just a matter of execution, uh, having to put thought into it and make decisions or cognitive load uh, as the term that we've been using just adds a whole new dynamic to it. And I know we struck a chord with the participants because we're still getting emails about it from participants. We're still getting calls. Awesome. You, know, I, you know, I, today something came to mind and I, and I thought, and they, they want to discuss something that happened in the event. And I'm very, very, very gratified by that. And I think that that's what's telling me that we accomplished what we set out to do. And I think Eric's got something he wants to add. Yeah, Eric, go ahead, buddy. You got something to say? <clears throat> so 
night before John and I were having a conversation, we were sitting around the lounge in the hotel and we were trying, trying to like artic- do some final articulation in our head. And the, one of the things that popped up was we wanted to give decision-making back to the students, to the shooters. Um, far too often it's draw, shoot this, that number of times. And a lot of times you'll see a decision-making drills that are live fire. We shoot the red triangle. Or if we tell you to shoot the blue square, whatever number's in it, the number it is, right? So we're, they're getting told what to do, even though it's in theory judgment, the students being told how to solve that problem. And our goal was to set up problems that they had to identify, then identify the solution and then deliver the solution to it. Well, and, and guys, I'm, you know, not trying to read you guys minds um, about some of the drills you got. I mean, I, I have a, a working knowledge of some of what you guys did, but rightly so, you know, we don't want to give away all those details, but already from some of the discussions, I've already set up a few drills that my, my son's going to be here this weekend. And we're going to play around with some cognitive loading at the gun range between myself and my son. And and to me, it, it was kind of a, I don't know, an epiphany. It's like, why? I mean, I know I need to do this stuff. And I know of ways that I can induce this kind of additional stress in a fairly easy way, or at least for some of the drills. And why have I not been doing it? And really, guys, it was hearing you guys mentioned this coming together and then also the event taking place that it's like, why on earth am I not doing some form of this in my own training? So, so I'll let you guys know how that goes. My, my son, he, he doesn't know we're going to be doing some of these drills. So I'm, I'm kind of pumped about it. So did, are you there, Eric? I thought you were going to say something and, and I lost your, your vocal there. Oh, no, I've got a, weird allergy cough that I'm trying to stay okay. muted on unless I have to talk, but John definitely wants to talk. <laughs> well, well one say, of, the, the kind ahead, of John. tie on to what Eric was saying. Um, one of the things that the, the shooting industry is good at is cranking out a lot of high volume classes. And part of that is uh, of the experience you get is necessitated by cranking a lot of people through uh a lot of classes are just square range drills because they're very profitable and, and easy to deliver, right? But the problem is, as part of those square range drills, all, there are a lot of critical decisions that you will have to make in the real world, right? That are completely stripped from you. Like, for instance, you know, even which target to shoot, you're going to shoot this target directly in front of you. You know, one of the things I loved about one of the blocks that Eric ran was there were two targets in front of you and you weren't told which of the two you would have to assess and or possibly shoot. So I think that this idea of returning these critical decisions back to the students is really important. Um, I think you're at least familiar with some of the, uh, the experiential labs that Craig Douglas does at TACCON, and it's amazing to watch the wheels fall off of people. And I think those wheels fall off because, number one, it's a stressful event in the as far in terms of where you are being evaluated by your peers. But the ugly truth is, is these people think they're prepared, but they've never been tasked with the vast amount of decisions that they're actually going to have to make. So returning those decisions to the students can be really important. Um, Most of us make assumptions about things that are quote unquote easy, but they aren't, you know, for instance, just, you know, Every target you shoot, almost every target you shoot has clearly defined lines. It's like, you know, walks around, says, you know, insert bullets here. That's not how the real world works. And I can tell you from doing this now for three years, if you just give the typical person, even someone that's fairly well trained with a handgun, a, you know, a bare, uh, you know, torso without any anatomical, you know, without, you know, aiming points on it and say, you know, hey, use the anatomical landmarks to put a good hit on there. Very few people can actually do that. But we somehow assume they're going to do that while under huge amounts of stress. So I I think that one of our big goals was to start to return decision making, critical decision making back to the students. And I like to think we were we were pretty effective with it as well. Well, it certainly sounds like it. Um, Lee, you 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 have something to say, buddy? Lee, you're muted. 
Well, Steve wasn't here, so somebody had to do it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, what, yeah the piggy, what he had to say, buddy, go for it. To, to piggyback off of, off of John, uh, and high volume classes being easy to to produce, they are. I'm talking about it's you can get out there and you can run lots of high round count drills, and of course everybody loves it to go faster, go faster, go faster. Part of it, and that's entertainment for a certain degree. Yeah. Claude Warner lives lives fairly local to me, so I get to interact with him a good bit. And he said something one night at, at a dinner that, you know, so much of firearms training is nothing more than firing squad training. Yeah. And I heard it's always him say been that. uh, that's always been a motivator to me is to make sure that my classes, should Claude just pop in on one, that he doesn't walk up and see firing squad training. He sees actual teaching people what they need to know. Um, and I, I think we were able to accomplish that or the, we allowed the students to accomplish it. Maybe a better way of, uh, of saying that. Uh, I think people were realized that just to get the gun out quickly is important, but shooting as fast as you can may be a detriment. Yeah, I, I definitely would like to talk a little bit about that because that was um, something that that you guys spoke about at TACCON, you know, was, you know, not shooting beyond not shooting beyond um, when you can stop shooting, not make a bad decision beyond that point. Right. So maybe we can hit on that here in a second. Um, but, yeah, you I think you hit hit something there, Lee, that I think. Is, is important to me and, and what I'm concerned about, and I'll ask, I'll ask you guys this and, and I'll, I'll, I'll ask um, in order if, are we in fact seeing an increase in, in the training community? When I, well, not training community. Yeah. The training community, folks that seek out training, are we seeing an increase in individuals that, want this type of training or am I can, is my concern that, Hey, is it still going to be this high bar that, that folks just, you know, it's not as interesting to them like the entertainment, like you said, Lee, and, and, and I'll ask you, Eric, are, are you, are you seeing an increase in folks wanting this type of training, this decision-making training? I'm not seeing a swell of people who haven't been exposed to it, raising their hand, going, Ooh, I want to do this. What I'm seeing is when people get exposed to it, they're like, I want, <clears throat> where has this been? Why haven't we done it? And I want to do more. All right. And I'll have maybe 10, 15% of the folks go, I don't need this. All right. I'm not going to fight you, but I'm seeing a lot of folks going, why haven't we done this in the past? And there's a retired army colonel who did a, did, did a bunch of doctrinal writing for the army for years. Um, I know John knows him first name, Clint and had him in a class. And I just was, I was kind of beta testing some of my rule two and rule four stuff that was part mm. of the conclave. And when we started talking about it, after I had all the students run the drill, it was like somebody turned the lights on in a football stadium not when they've been on for a half hour, but when you first flip the switch and you get that real dim glow and a couple lights. And then over time, like all the lights come on and it was like, rut row. And he was extremely positive about it, but he was kind of like, yeah, like hadn't thought about this before this way. <clears throat> so I, I think once people get exposed to at least the idea, but for sure the application or the opportunity, they get interested in it. Well, what what my concern is, and and you guys can probably, you know, you, you can probably empathize with this this feeling that I have is that I am I've been engrossed around a group of people for twenty years, maybe not the Range Master family up until the last handful of years, but I've been engrossed for the last 20 years around people that think like we do. Right. And I'm just hoping that this 
what what I am seeing anecdotally is an increase in desire for this type of stuff. And I'm just hoping that that it is an increase in in folks wanting to do it. But um, Lee, um, I would ask you, are you do you feel like you're seeing a, an increased desire in this form of training? Uh, not to a large degree, except for people who are, as Eric was saying, that are exposed to it or they hear the people who are exposed to it talking about it. I think exactly you're seeing, I think the other side's actually going faster. The chase, the metrics, the, because we can, we can do something on this piece of paper and it gives us an immediate score and we can look at the timer. That's easy to produce. And And it's fun. Yeah, it is fun. Yeah. I put out something a year or so ago that kind of sent some people, which is kind of why I did it. Um, was that the people who have no actual application experience tend to focus on things like metrics, whereas the people who are coming from an application side that have actually experienced that tend to focus on things like decision-making. And I I think that drives a lot of things. And, and, you know, the old saying is funny because it's true. Well, it makes people mad because it's true. It's also out there um you know people like you with, with your show and your audience are tending to drive it the people that listen to that weems guy you know they're getting exposed to to us and, and like-minded people on a regular basis and those audiences are waking people up to that and reaching it but i still don't think it's to the same level of hey let's all go chase our grandmaster cord well and and lee it may never be that way unfortunately i, I would hope you know, I mentioned this pretty often that that um, EvoSec started, well, for several reasons. And one of the big reasons was a light bulb when Carl Wren talked about, you know, getting people beyond that 1% and how he mentioned that if you're at even just at the local level and you have some competence and you have some skills to offer and help people, if you're not doing that, you are... I think his words were you were part of the problem, you know, not, not being yeah. rude, but, but again, I, I like to think about it this way. What, what would happen if we got f- people past the 2%, you know, and in just a, just, just that additional percent is double the people that we have currently in the industry. And I'm thinking, getting people past 2% will be, in my opinion, monumental. And I'm just hoping that we're heading that direction. Frankly, that's just my thoughts. Well, Dave Spalding and I had a text conversation this morning and he sent me a link to a podcast and he said, listen to the first three minutes of it and tell me what you think. And it was a preacher. And the preacher was talking about, you know, you can get some people that tell you that, man, I've got eight Bibles. I've got a King James. I've got a, you know, and like the light eight different translations of it and everything. Well, what's in it? What's in them? And they can't tell you. And it's like, was that a likening to the community? Because people, they want to go buy the latest gear. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, they want to get the latest gadget. Uh, Last week, I attended a class that is based on Rogers. And I caught myself thinking through the class and everything, you know what, I could come back next year with X pistol, with why modification done to it, all this kind of stuff to game this whole class versus shooting at it with my duty gear and gun as it's you're supposed to do. Uh, yeah, it's fun. I can go out and buy another plate or two. But is the skill level there is the big thing. Are you putting in that work? Um, you know, and we're no different. Golfers buy the latest golf club that comes out. Yep. Fishermen buy the latest lure. Jeep people buy everything. And it's just, <laughs> yeah, we're people and we can't get yeah. past that. Well, we do like our gear. I mean, yeah, it, it's fun, but the reality is, is that really it's, it's not nearly much as the, dr- the driver as the actual gaining of the real, the actual skills. Well, John, I'll ask you this is that, 
is part of it because I mean, all of us, I wouldn't call us senior citizens by any stretch, but we're, we're all, we're all getting up there a little bit. We're, you know, I'll be 50 this year and I know you guys are, um, at least my age are a little older than me. Um, it, John, is it, is it a maturity thing too? You know, am, am, am I wrong in that? Is that part of it? Well, I think part of it is, is just not knowing what you don't know. And for years, faster, you know, more demanding metrics has kind of been what's out there. So for a long time, there simply weren't that many options. There's not, there wasn't, well, there were, there were, there were two options. You could either go really, really fast or there were the simunitions courses. And that was, I think, I, quite honestly, too deep into a pool for most people. Uh, Carl Wren talks about how it's impossible to fill up those classes. So I think what, what has been needed is kind of a middle ground where you can experience, at least get a bite of the apple, maybe not have the whole apple shoved down your throat at the same time, but <clears> maybe <throat> able to you know take smaller bites and understand what's going on. Um, I would say that, you know, part of the maturity is if, you know, I think Lee made a good point that if you watch the application side of this is that a lot of times or, or it's not uncommon. It's hard to see f major failures that are routed, rooted solely in a failure of technical skill, you know, and I'm always going to take more technical skill than less. But the simple reality is that there's more to the problems than what your draw speed is and your splits. Um, you know, you don't want to go faster. You want to go sooner. Um, I can negate a, a half second lag or a half second slower draw stroke if I simply make the decision to go to guns a second earlier. The problem is we just haven't had any uh, avenues where that was could be easily taught uh, as far as that goes. Um, you know, the question you were asking those guys is like, have you seen stuff? And this is where I'll, I'll say I'm a little cautiously optimistic. Um, most of the classes, my live fire classes I've been teaching, uh, again, I'm in my third year now, is Cognitive Pistol. That's my my kind of like landmark class. And the whole purpose of that class was to uh, make people think with a gun in your hand and add cognitive load to the class. Um, those classes had been very, very well received. Um, I've only not sold out, I think, like one class since then. Uh, part of that's just because I can only really teach once a month as far as that goes. So I think amongst, I hate to say the intelligentsia because it kind of implies that these are the only smart people. There's plenty of smart people that disagree with us. Um, but among a certain people that take this matter seriously, um, they realize they've got to have something else. Uh, and so you can call that maturity or you can just call that the acceptance of reality, which they may be the same thing. Well, what I'm encouraged by, because, you know, I've been a proponent of of using you know, scenario based training, simunitions, UTM, r run our own courses um, using those methods. Not a, nearly the degree of of some of some of our mentors, but I've been a proponent of that for many years. And what I'm excited about the cognitive conclave and what you guys are doing is I am in the hopes that it is going to be that other realm that folks can seek out that aren't willing to go into the aforementioned courses. And, and, but then at the same time, I see it as a possibility that then, okay, this isn't so bad. Well, now I'm going to try this or vice versa. Frankly, yeah. Eric, you're going to say something, buddy, go ahead. So <clears throat> this is one of the things we kicked around that, where did this fall on that spectrum, right? Square range training over here, quality force on force with whatever projectile over here. And we came to the conclusion that this sat somewhere in the middle, but at least or tilting towards the, the force on force side of it, but it didn't involve the other people, right? So the thinking level required, the processing level required was on the path to the force on force, but you you didn't have the issues that go with it, the need for support, the need for safeties, the need for a whole bunch of other people to be involved that make doing that difficult, as well as the student side of things too. So they were still going to be doing something they were comfortable with on a square range with a gun in their hand, but it wasn't going to be a thousand rounds over the weekend. It was going to be a lot of, th a lot of thought over the weekend. And it what? wasn't, the other thing too that I don't think we've hit on is, 
we weren't just on the range with some with a wide variety of targets. There was lecture, there was lecture, there was discussion, there was interactive stuff in the classroom that teed up what we were doing on the range. Well, and, and Eric, <clears throat> I, you, you just beat me to it. So I'll just mention up front. So number one, you guys had 26 attendees, correct? Yes. For, for, for an inaugural class of this type, man, I, I thought that was awesome. Um, yeah, and it was the same weekend as the Girl in the Gun National Conference. I, we would have hit 30 without that. Wow. Oh, I think we would have yeah. had a waiting list. Yeah, I think yeah. So. I don't think we just would have filled it. I think we would have had a waiting list. Well, um, w- one of the things that, that I was going to say is also you, you guys talk about high round count courses. Your guys – recommendation was 500 rounds right and you guys from what i understand you guys got close to it but you know some folks took some ammo home we were what i've seen as low as 225 and as high as 250 and and what i was going to point out about that is and this may not you know some folks listening in the audience may not may not see it that way but i i would like to encourage folks to think the inverse of the amount of rounds shot is the increase in the, in the the cognitive load and the cognitive learning so to me i think that's that says a lot in my opinion and not only did you have the shooting that you did that the student did the students all also had the chance to watch their peers and how their peers were perceiving and processing problems and I think that went a good way towards the learning experience. Yeah, and you you guys keep saying experience. I think that's that's the way to say this is that it, it it's not a course, it's not a class. I think that's the way to go forward. Is that that it's an experience? Um, yeah, I think that's the best way to think about it. And, and frankly, I think that's a a mental cue for folks listening that. It's it's not just a class. It's a, it's an experience that you're going to take extremely valuable lessons from. John, you 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 had your hand up for a second. I was going to say, I just it suddenly occurred to me that we're making this sound like a Grateful Dead concert, which it was in fact not. <laughs> and I'll tell they you, are guys, one county away from me. <laughs> you, you know what's funny, guys? I I'll just say this on the air. This is a this is the first time that number one I've had more than one interviewee and the whole hands thing is, <laughs> is new to me, but I I was going to joke with Lee um, that, Hey, this is my first attempt to, to um, copy some of what Lee's doing and having um, 15 people on a show. <laughs> Go, ahead. Go ahead, Lee. Well, much like, the shows can be easier by having multiple guests because yeah. it cuts down on the host workload for the, for a lot, of, a lot of it. Having two other instructors plus Steve is a good instructor in his own right. Mm-hmm. There takes the load off. And, you know, we had, while everyone was in the classroom for, for lectures or presentations, whatever you prefer to call them, like Eric would be the lead guy talking. John and I supplemented that, and we had class discussion. All right, well, then we would divide the classes class up into two different groups and say, John's teaching on one range, Eric's teaching on the other. And I could kind of go back and forth between the two, and we kept, all right, Eric, I go over character Eric, all right, I need 15 more minutes to finish, and go back to John's like, John, be done with yours in 15 minutes. And, and we were able to coordinate and tie all that together and keep the students moving and engaged the entire time. Now that there was some time uh, where like you had one person shooting, well, that means everybody else is standing around while one person shooting. Uh, but for the most part, we were able to keep all the people engaged. Uh, it was easier on us from a, a presenter standpoint as you didn't carry the whole load for two days. Yeah, and, and I think that that was great. And we had three different perspectives that were all uh, complementary of each other, uh, le- putting out the material. Plus, there were some heavy hitters in the student 
and the student card. It, it sounds added like added it. a lot. Some of them I know. Them, yep. them, yeah, they added a lot to the content. Well, and I think you hit it on the head. And and, and guys, I I will not feign to have your guys' um, teaching experience within the firearms community. Of course, my the bulk of my um, expertise is in is in the empty hands side. That's where you know. For many many years, starting when I was a uh, in high school, when I started teaching martial arts, but um, so I do have um, a lot of teaching experience. Um, but but what you just said, Lee, about having again, I, I've I've been in your guys' classes or in your lectures. You guys certainly complement each other um, phenomenally. And but to to what you said, any of the classes that I've done with my brother Aaron, and frankly, um, my son has been been helping me do some of my courses here. Man, anytime I have either one of their help or Brian's help, man, the the it just runs so much smoother. You know, when you when you have that second person to to um, I don't know balance things. But I, I'm I'm an ima- I'm imagining from what how I know you guys now, even though I've only known you guys for a few years, I'm sure that was a a key portion of your guys' class. Well, we've done enough stuff with each other, either on the phone or on the podcast, to be able to bounce off and to kind of know where. Okay, I know where John's going. There's going to be a there's going to be a gap here that dovetails into something I want to cover. I can bounce in, hit it, bounce out, and John can keep going, or you know, vice versa with Lee stuff too. We've we've just had enough exposure to each other to know where and how and when we can make those additions. So it does help. I would, you know, I, I think that you know it's a it's it's like an executive term now, but I think synergy is very much a real thing. Uh, I made the comment before. When the three of us got together, we had a basic outline of what we were going to do. I knew it was going to be a solid program. I figured that we'd run a solid first run and then we would take notes and then we'd use that to make the next one a lot better. And I think one of the things that absolutely stunned and amazed me was like we turned out a solid product right from the word go. And based on the feedback we've been getting uh, the students are like, we can't take anymore. We were trying to figure out what we're going to do next time to add to this thing. And uh, for only having fired that, you know, 250 rounds, we, we had completely fried people out just with that little bit of work. So I I, I was amazed at, the, you know, how well the four of us worked together. Because, again, um, you know, uh, I, I got to say nice things about Steve. You know, Steve and I like to make gadgets. The difference is if you ask me to make something to accomplish something, mine will have twice as many parts as whatever Steve designs and will be only half as reliable. <laughs> Steve, Steve, <clears throat> Steve's input was very impactful on the stuff I was doing. Um, Steve set the conditions and set the equipment to allow me not only to, to expose the students to what I wanted to expose them to, but to also collect some data that was kind of secondary uh, based on some research studies that I present that aren't as complete as I'd like them to be because they don't get into skill sets um, or techniques that, that I tend to prefer. So they, they kind of hit partial and I wanted to try to collect some data with those other things. And Steve was able to give me the, what's the phrase we're using Lee for Steve stuff? Apparata the apparatus to, to let me get that, get some of that data and to make the students work at solving the problems. Yeah, it, it sounds awesome. Um, from, from what I'm gathering from, from the AAR that I read and, and of course, Lee, the show that you had with your um, brethren here on, on this show, it, it sounds like it, it, it went awesome. And and I, I would digress a second. So um, I'm assuming apparati is the plural of apparatus. I certainly yes. hope so. Um, um, <laughs> uh, mechanism, actually, mechanisms, target systems, <laughs> well, I, whatever I, you want to call, call it. I called them contraptions. One of them, one of the ones. I said, "Hey, uh, your contraption." Steve looked at me and said, "It's not a contraption. It's an apparatus." <laughs> And so I, I yeah. have not made the, the mistake I, of calling them I, I contraptions like anymore. Should they have <laughs> I, 
Well, I'm deeply suspicious that Steve may be Rube Goldberg reincarnated. That's the, the theory I'm working with right now. Entirely possible. It's <laughs> awesome. Well, well, guys, we're we're sitting here. I'm getting closer to an hour. Um, maybe I'll put you guys on the spot a minute. Um, maybe I can ask all three of you guys. You know, without giving up too much um, proprietary information, if you guys could just kind of give a, a an example of some of your your um, your actual courses, not necessarily courses of fire, but your your modules. That's the word I'm looking for. If you could just kind of give a brief description of one of your primary modules, um, so that that our audience out there can know what they're going to get into when they get in the course. Cause I believe we're going to get folks into the class. Um, Eric, I'll start with you if you're good with that, buddy. Yeah. So, uh, sorry about that. So kind of twofold. One was looking at ready positions and information gathering. I've done uh, the presentation at TACCON the last couple of years on ready positions and better outcomes. And it was how to take some of the some of the stuff in the research that led to those presentations and actually bring it to life. So not just talking about it with PowerPoint, but letting people experience those things. Um, the other part of it was taking rule two and rule four a bit more seriously than I think the community does on occasion. And this this is not a knock. It's just it's hard to do on square range when you have a two dimensional cardboard target and a 40 foot chunk of dirt behind them. Right, that that what's down range gets a little bit of lip service, and running your muzzle across things gets a little bit of lip service. So, both my classroom stuff and <clears throat> the thinking part of the live fire over on my side of the range was devoted to working those two issues. Well, and and Eric, what I'll say is that I had I don't know when it was the first time I heard you talk about your number two and number four work. Um, I don't, I mean, it may have just been recently, but I heard you mention it at one point and it had my brain working. And as a matter of fact, some of what I plan on doing this weekend with my son is, is incorporating some of that. So I'll let you know how that goes. I look forward to it. Well, um, John, um, could you talk about one of your modules? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'll, talk about basically both modules that I did. I, I'm, you know, the, there aren't any trade secrets here or anything like that, that I'm not uncomfortable sharing with. Um, so I would say my, my two blocks I did were the, the decision-making with lights. So what I wanted, and I, I'm probably on my seventh revision was I wanted a way to make people make decisions off of gathering visual information and slowly ramp up the complexity as far as what we're dealing with. So if you can imagine a 30 caliber ammo can, I've got three of those uh, on the front face of one of those, or each of them are three different LEDs that I can control remotely. So I can turn all the lights on at once. I can turn any single individual light on, and I then contextualize what those things mean for the students. So at the most basic level, uh, one light is a headshot, two lights is a pair to the body, and three lights is a draw and challenge. Because number one, everybody thinks that would logically be a failure drill, but I think we you know, we've got the, the, the idea that we shoot too much in shooting classes, but I don't think people appreciate how much a good, strong draw and challenge um, can mean in the real world. So Absolutely. just getting people used to getting the gun out of the holster and doing something other than shooting. Um, I don't know of any other curriculum in which so many challenges are offered as, uh, you know, by the students. So we start out really simple and we just gradually ramp that up. So because of the control I have and the fluidity there, I can make you, I can give you the information that makes you draw to the low ready and challenge the target. I they can then make you fire a pair to the body and then make you fire a headshot. So you're basically having to make a decision to fire a headshot based on environmental information. Now it, it would be perfect if it was on the target, but we can't do that. So we just work that up and we scale that up in complexity up to the point that, you know, uh, one set of lights are the conditions uh, required to use deadly force. The other set of lights is what you're going to deliver. And I can put these around you in a 360 degree awareness and I can make people have a legitimate scan in, in class, which is something that while we may pay lip service to it, almost never actually happens. 
So that was probably the biggest part just from a time management part. Uh, the other um, the other block that I taught dealt with uh, the concept of tactical anatomy. Um, you know, as, as I touched on earlier, most people don't understand basic human anatomy and where you have to place the bullets to make them stop, to make, to make the bullets be the most effective way they can to make the stop, the threat stop as soon as possible. So I had a, a quick little classroom lecture where we go over some of that. We watch um, people being shot, people being stabbed, trying to understand what works. And then I have, uh, I call it redneck tech. I've engineered up a pretty realistic 3D human torso that has all the proper anatomy in there. And then we um, make you fire at the shots. Um, you know, everybody wants to play CSI technicians. So I have the rods you can run up through the body, yeah. see where you're where the where the wound tracks would have been and then we start working some of that decision making as well so those those were the two blocks that i ran as far as this uh as far as this time around well and and you just you said something <clears throat> prior um to answering your question that i think is crucial i'm always cognizant about not giving not asking people to give up information they don't want to talk about but I'm also very, very mindful of the fact that giving the information that you gave, gave folks a, a good understanding or excuse me, gave folks a summary of what you're doing, but that doesn't mean they can go out and apply that. You know, they, they have to be under the guidance of, of say somebody with your expertise. And frankly, the other aspect is, is, is even still they would have to put forth the effort to do that, you know? So i and I guess what I'm getting at is that nothing ever replaces being under the guidance of folks that have been doing this work like you guys. And so I, I guess that's what I wanted to add to that. But the other I thing, if I could just, you, go ahead, go ahead, I'm please. I, I think that it's important to note, um, you know, it, if we can go down the, the pedagogy road real quick, um, a lot of this is experiential learning, okay? All we're doing is we're giving you the tools that you need to teach yourself. You know, um, none of this stuff is, you know, learning per se. I'm giving you the, the tools and the environment, and you're effectively teaching yourself. And that, that kind of teaching model seems to work really, really well. Um, the learning by doing seems to be highly effective as far as this goes. And I would say that, that, you know, that, that model of teaching was applied, uh, throughout the conference or throughout the event, I guess. Yeah. It, sound, it sounds like it was for certain, John, Eric, you, you had something to add. <clears throat> I can't remember specifically what it was I wanted to say. That thought went away, but it wasn't just two-dimensional targets. We had movers, we had turners, we were on steel, we were on paper. Timers were used, but not in the traditional way. So yeah, yeah. They, they were I, they were used to stimulate some speed, but it was to get to a learning objective. Well, what I was going to add is, is that from the pictures that I saw from the event, yeah, I mean, you guys, you guys had a, a plethora of, of of targets you know and, and not not normally seen at any one particular course so again that's another experience that folks um would have at your guys experience that they're not going to likely see in a lot of or, or if any other course so yeah I, that that's definitely something i picked up on um one other thing and i want to move to lee to to talk about um some of his blocks is you guys all three have spoke this evening about, you know, at drawing to the ready, you know, and how important that is. And, and frankly, it wasn't until I got under the range master family that, that that epiphany came into my mind is that what I am, I am wrong for not making sure that every time that I draw the pistol, I am not making a shooting decision, you know? So I think that's huge. And, and, and folks out in the audience need to realize that, that, you know, you need to be under folks that are giving you the opportunity to do other things when you draw the pistol instead of just shooting. So that, that was another thing I wanted to make a, a fine point about. Um, John, you raised your hand for a second, buddy. Yeah. I was going to 
out there that, you know, the reality is this is, you know, everybody wants to be steely eyed dealers of death. The vast majority of defensive gun uses in this country do not involve the discharge of the firearm. Awesome. That's, that's, you know, you know, there's a difference between having your, you know, training model reality versus something more like a fantasy band camp. You know, I know it's more of a law enforcement specific context, but, you know, drawing and challenging from a low ready solves a remarkable amount of problems. And it's what happens in the real world, you know? Well, and, and I'd like to really drive home the fact that you cover somebody with a, with a muzzle that they shouldn't be covered with that muzzle you could be in jail for a long time, you know? So if you aren't including putting into your, even just your personal range training, having that as an aspect of your training, then, then unfortunately it, it could get you in trouble. And, and so that's another reason why we implore folks to, to make sure that you're getting that, that type of, of training into your own practice and, and especially learning under folks like you guys that include that as a um, fixture of your training. So um, now, Lee, how about you, buddy? Can you um, give us a rundown or a summary of of at least maybe one of your blocks? Sure. But before I do that, I want to touch on the ready thing. Uh, for just another Thank second you, sir. Uh, I think one is you need to have a clear definition of what you mean by the ready. Hmm. I, I define a ready position as the firearm is in the hands, but and you're prepared to act, but no part of the muzzle is covering meat. Absolutely. And I stress that definition because here's the thing. If, if I can document that that's what I trained you to, that's the standard that I trained you to the definition that I trained you to. And actually in my pistol craft class, I actually test you on that in our course of fire at the end of the day, there's a draw to it ready and give a verbal command where you don't shoot. And I actually walk up and down the line to make sure everybody's muzzle is not covering any part of what would be the person represented by the target so that I can sit on a witness stand and testify that I trained you, Eric, that this is the definition of ready that I tested you on it in class. And so that way, when you testify that you drew your pistol to a ready position, that you no part of the muzzle was covering the person, that we can validate that in your training. And Excellent. I think that's a huge deal that as trainers, we need to be setting up our students for success. It's not how to murder and get away with it. In this sense, we're specifically talking about how to not use yeah. deadly force. Uh, but you know, we have to have court defensible training. And I think that's one thing that those of us that are coming from a very strong application side background bring that the metric side of it does it. And I'm not saying don't go have fun. Don't go try to push yourself to the peak of your <clears> performance. <throat> There's a place for that. But you also need to balance that with other things. You know, don't take application advice from someone who's not able to justify as an expert witness on the use of force yeah. in court. Well, well Lee, if I it, if I could really drive home something important, you know, I, I always like to talk about mental cues and, you know, as important as the cognitive conclave discussion is, um, that's really about trying to make sure people are seeking out your guys experience mm -hmm. or courses like it. But sometimes in the middle of a show, I make the point and drive home the point that this this bit of information may be one of the most important things that you can hear. And I would say what you, you just articulated there, folks need to really internalize about that ready position and being, uh, being able to articulate what you did in a defensive use situation that likely, you know, what, what is it? And you guys can correct me. I mean, I've heard, I've seen the statistics running from somewhere between 85 to 90 percent of the time that a that a pistol is used in self-defense that the trigger doesn't even have to be pulled a am i wrong in that is that is that an over over um, broad statistic i'll ask uh john on that one i can't quote the exact number but that's based on clex work uh in his book point blank but i think his finding was that about 80 percent of defensive gun uses do not involve the pressing of the trigger that the firing the gun is, takes place in the minorities of the events. 
that and we're not talking about actually hitting the person, we're just talking about the gun actually discharging, probably is only present in about 20% of defensive gun uses. Um, you know, it's all about, you know, the, the, the criminal is looking for an easy person to take. And as soon as they realize that they've made a uh, tragic miscalculation of the victim selection process, they realize they have better places to be and more important things to do. Well, and, and I'd like to add to that. So I, I'm not, I'm not at all um, wanting my righteous shooting, right? I mean, I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not hoping for my opportunity to use the skills that I've developed over these years. I'm not looking for that at all. Frankly, I don't want to have to go through the experience the aftermath, the legal aftermath. So if, if I make sure that part of my training includes this aspect of making sure that I have a properly defined and well-trained ready position, that it's likely that I could in that situation that could have went lethal, but then I go through just a minor amount of, of legal proceedings. I mean, I think that's worth, worth this weight in gold, frankly, is, is making sure that we're thinking about it that way. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. Well, well, Lee, well, very, very well said. Um, so as far as your blocks of instruction, you want to summarize one possibly? Sure. Um, I only did one line fire block, so I can only summarize one. Uh, I guess <laughs> other than the, we did some cold skills testing as well. Um, the Bakersfield, right? We did the Bakersfield call yep. and we did Justin Dahl's five year ground up. Oh, not two, and, two awesome um, drills. Yeah. Um, basically, what I did was I don't mind saying it, I played a shell game with him. He was like, watch this hand over here so you don't see what this hand is doing. Is I made them believe that I was teaching them about a particular technique for manipulating the gun, nuclear malfunction, and that I was. I was actually teaching a technique for that. But the whole point was to put something in their mind to get them away from what I was actually watching for. And I actually did a, a skills test for a particular thing that people did with a firearm, so we would have a re representative time sample for it. But they all preloaded that motor program and knew what they were going to do well then they were later surprised with the opportunity to perform that same technical skill and a lot of people stopped and were sitting there looking at their gun like what do i do oh this is what i do at this point and they were totally surprised by it and then i put some cognitive stacking on them and uh, force them to actually diagnose what was going on with their pistol and execute a skill. And some people performed quite well. Some people were completely overloaded. And that's fine. Uh, you know, it's, we need to learn in this environment. And uh, I, I don't mind kind of giving away some of that because I'm actually going to change that block for next year in the way I present it. Um, and go, take it a little different route and do the same things, but, but present it in a different standpoint. Well, and, and guys, I would tell you that um, from what you guys have described tonight and, and what I've read and, and, and again, some of what you guys did in the course, I've heard you guys talk about before mm -hmm. in, in the past. And I think the, the main point to drive home is that, you know, folks out there in the audience, um, the next the next opportunity you have, and I'll just ask you guys on the air, um, is there any, do you guys have it on white paper again on the calendar? What are we looking at? We will definitely be moving forward uh, with this in years to come. Uh, we have tentatively selected locations so far for next year will be Terre Haute, Indiana and Oklahoma City. Uh, we, oh, don't know, nice. we don't know the dates yet, but uh, those are probably where we're going to be next year. So Indiana and Oklahoma City. It just gives me an excuse to go home. Yep. Yeah, I'm and, definitely. Uh, gonna... I'm not sure we go should ahead. mention this or not, but uh, John Hoshin is very interested in what we've been doing. And if the venue, we have some concerns with range and capacity and venues, but if we can get the venues and the capacity that we need, uh, we'll probably be bringing in Hoshin as well. Uh, 
you know, nice. John was a great trainer for a lot of times. He's been off the road for a time. So uh, he's one of those guys that you definitely need to train with. And this is, this is potentially one of the few opportunities you'll actually get to do that. Well, um, I, I certainly am interested in what John has, has been doing. I, I mean, I, I'm I'm going to say it on the air. I think I said it not too long ago. Um, you know, I I was up in in the well south of Seattle for 11 years, and I could have been training with John. And it, it's it's one of those baffling things. You you go down the road and you figure out, man, I was sitting right there. I missed. I could have made the the um fast. I guess when Marty Hayes had TatCon. You know, I wasn't, I frankly just, Hey, I'm going to claim Dunning Kruger <laughs> in that sense. I didn't know. I didn't know it was going on in my backyard and I didn't know enough about John Holsham. Um, to, and, and what's funny is that, um, um, Jeff Mal, the owner of Tenacore, I, I've known Jeff for many years. Um, you know, I've, um, been in, Four ECQCs with Jeff. Every single time I hosted ECQC, he was there, and and of course he was he was working with John Holsham at that point. I, I just never talked to him about it. I I, I should have seeked him out. I mean, there's opportunities in the in the future, but but yeah, that sounds yeah. great, guys. I, I I are there any? Are we talking about any time frame that you guys are putting on on the calendar yet? Any estimate? Well, we got to we got to take into account weather. Yep. Uh, so we also have to take you know if we push too late into the year in Oklahoma with it being central, then we will get time change. Yeah, uh, and so that would affect the, you know it gets dark out there at five o'clock during during certain times of the year. So we, we've got to take all that into account. Uh, though there's going to be range availability around uh, their events. With Red Hill Range, we had two bays in a classroom. And that was our minimum to pull it off the way we want it. Uh, we're actually, one of the reasons we're selecting the venues that we're selecting this coming year is that there was a possibility of three bays to go along nice. with the classroom so we could divide uh, the, the class up to get the groups even smaller so that there would be less uh, downtime with any kind of individual drills. Um, that, and that would put more work on us, but it would also, I think, create a better event. So that became kind of our standards. We were we, minimum was two two bays in a classroom. Hopefully, three bays in a classroom. And Terre Haute and Oklahoma City have stepped forward uh, with that. Plus, we have two people on the ground at each of those clubs that locally want the event and want to help push it. Yeah, you know, that, that's one of the things with events is sometimes people's like, "Well, why don't you have it at XYZ facility?" Is XYZ facility available? Well, I, I don't know. Who do I talk to there? Well, I don't know. You know, and so uh, we, we've got two two people locally on the ground that are wanting to help push these push the event at their venues, and I think that's going to be a big deal. Um, you know, Oklahoma City, we can get people out of the Dallas area that you know it's only three hours away, so we, we can kind of come back there. Terre Haute, you know, you're an hour out of Indianapolis, you're just a few hours out of St. Louis and Chicago, so you can pull in from some of those metro areas uh, pretty easily as well, and they're active training communities in both both places and i think that's a big thing um well what, what i'll what i'll add lee is uh is i i am absolutely um mm -hmm. running through my you know my options here i I'd, I'd love to to be able to host you guys here for it my problem yeah. is um i i have a phenomenal facility range wise mm -hmm. um the yeah. new range that i belong to so it's very possible that I could have the three bays. The problem there is they don't have a classroom. Right. <laughs> so, um, so I'm looking at some other options, yeah. but, but I'll just say over the air, I've already been analyzing my sure. options. Um, I wasn't sure if it's something you guys were going to want to take mm -hmm. on the road or not, but I've been yeah. thinking about it. So yeah. But, In addition to just classroom, we want the classroom to be big enough to hold all of the attendees. Oh yeah. At the same yeah. same time, so that we can do our safety brief, so that we can do our our classroom presentations that build on to the other event. And plus, if we run into inclement weather, we've got a place to fall back. And we each had other content prepared and ready to go in the event that we needed to do that. Well, I am outside of 
of the Fort Bragg area here. Um, I've got more options than than uh, than I'm speaking on now, but we'll see. One way or the other, I, I don't care if I I'm able to host you guys or not. I I want to I want to find my way into the course one way or the other. That that's what's going to happen. But well, well, guys, it's I think we're probably getting close to the close here. I, I see John. John's getting tired in there in his gym. He's wanting to hit the squat rack here. Um, he, he's <laughs> that took place earlier. Tomorrow will just be the suffering afterwards. <laughs> hey, do you, see, you have your light off. Did you? Um, I, I was going to ask you on the air. Um, you know, do, do you mind? Do you mind showing us? To, have you guys seen uh, John's new squat rack? <laughs> he may not be able to. <laughs> So this is this is the closest I have to a man cave. This was built for my business. So I got all my I was all training craft and stuff like that. But I finally do have a, a decent place to work out. I'm trying to get serious about getting back into shape. Uh, I guess the way I say it is I've been fat and I've been skinny and I've been weak and I've been strong. And I know which of those combinations I prefer. And I was trying to get back there. I got young kids that I need to stay fit for. And uh, they sit, they're they're gaining weight, so I have to be able to continue to toss them around the house. I got to get strong, so that's that's the plan. Well, I'm I'm digging your your gym. That's for certain. The only thing that that I would I think you need to add to it is some jujitsu mats. <laughs> Dude, the, the the building is only twelve by twenty, and it's full of crap. I've, I've got I'm, to come up with a better I'm solution playing. for my jits. I, I'm playing with you, buddy. To be honest with you, yeah, I'm lucky the the space that I have. I have a three car garage, so. So my home gym, I've got jujitsu mats um, as a big portion of it, and and we put it to use. I've got um, one of our main, um, one of my good friends. He's an assistant coach at my gym. He lives right down the street. Um, he's got mats at his house. I got mats at my house. We all put them to use. And there's a couple of other guys up the street that also train at my gym. So um, just uh. Real quick, I'll give a quick shout out. Um, I'm tied up with the uh, Mark Ripito's starting strength crew, and especially Nick Delgadillo. I think I pronounced his last name. Yep. Uh, that's a solid, solid program if you want to get stronger, and especially if you're not don't want like just pretty boy muscle. Uh, you know, I think my my years as an underwear model are pretty much over. I just want to be functionally fit for the foreseeable future. There we go. That was a that was there. A it gift. is man. That was a gift from Nick. Yeah, it, it is an outstanding program. I used used it for the last I don't know five or six years. It's it's outstanding. Yeah, but that was a, not, a nice gift from Nick for certain. Yeah, he's a good dude. Well, well, guys, real quick, um, um, let's let's just go ahead and go around around the room here. Anything else you guys would like to add, Eric? In closing. It wasn't the kind of event you could practice for. We, good. There were some questions good. about, like, what do I need to practice for this? Don't. Show up and learn. Um, that's, that's awesome. Like we said, the goal was to return decision-making back to the shooters. Take it out of the hands of the instructors. Let the shooters make the decisions to solve the problems they identified. And I think we were successful at that. Um I'm not going to knock the performance shooting crowd, right? Because you have to have a level of technical skill to, to have the decision-making, but the decision-making side of it is, should be an equal part of, of the program. And I'm just thankful for John and Lee for including me in this um, and putting this together. And for the folks that trusted us enough to come out and do the inaugural run with it. Sounds like it was an awesome event. I can't wait. I can't wait. John, what you got, buddy? I was going to throw, uh, you know, kind of dovetailing onto what Eric said, you know, uh, we our most common shooting metrics are, you know, speed and accuracy. At some point, discrimination is arguably more important than those, than either of those. And, you know, we just don't practice that discrimination process nearly enough. But uh, again, you know, just repeating what Eric said, um, I appreciate the people that had the faith in us. There are a lot of people that pretty much showed up based up, you know, they knew one, two or three of us. I mean, if they, if they showed up knowing all three of us, that's their own damn fault. But uh, I really do appreciate the vote of confidence that we got. Um, and a lot of the success the event had was because we had a solid group of shooters who could be trusted to make the decisions. 
uh, along the way. So that was uh, uh, key as for us as well. Awesome. Well, I will tell you guys when it when it was going on, I was sitting there at JRTC at uh, there in Louisiana. I was like a little kid going. <laughs> like, you, you were a JRTC, you poor bastard. <laughs> I was like, man, my, you know, I could be learning and, and having a good time. Instead, I'm here in, in Sleesville. <laughs> nah, it was, it was, I, I enjoy my job, my day job. I, I'm never bored, but I'd have much rather been with, with you guys during the event for certain, but, or else I would have certainly been there. Well, Lee, what you got in closing, buddy? You know, just kind of piggyback there off of what Eric said about technical shooting has its place. And, you know, John touched on that too. You know, we didn't have anybody that was an absolute soup sandwich. Uh, there was nobody we had to pull off of the line and fight to them or no, This is how you get the gun out of the holster. You know, pretty much everyone was, was, was squared away to that, that level of skill. Um, you know, we did kind of toss around, you know, what are we going to do as the thing continues to grow and, you know, it starts trying to attract, you know, people in. But I think as long as we get people that are dedicated enough to the art form and the material coming, I think we're going to be okay. Uh, I don't know if there's any kind of way we can put kind of a hard prerequisite of any kind of skills on. And just to, to reiterate Eric's point of, there's nothing you can practice other than your technical skill. Yeah. Uh, to come to the class. And so it's kind of funny. We're, we're, we're kind of, you know, poking the bear of the technical skill crowd a little bit, but that's the one thing you could have under your belt to come into the class uh, and test that with cognitive load and cognitive stacking. Well, and I think I really would like to add to that and, and drive home the, the fact that really folks need to go there and simply experience it, not worry about gaming, you know, the process or gaming the experience, man, you need to go there and Hey, frankly, you need to go there and fail. You know, you need to go there and, and, and experience what failures you have, what successes you have and learn from both. Right. You were about to say something, Lee. Yeah. We do need to thank Andy Stanford and Surefire. Yes, because uh, we we did provide uh, well, Surefire provided flashlights for the winners of some technical drills. Oh, cool! Uh, so if you want if you if you want to come and you just got a game and you got to win something, yes, there's a chance to win a shiny new flashlight Uh-oh. or something. There, that's um, always nice. Yeah, I um, I need a I need a new one for you guys. Got me into this um this new um shotgun thing. I was sure. going to mention a little bit, but. Uh, yeah. We can, yeah. You, you both, Eric and and Lee, you guys got me started on this new little shotgun. You know, when you care enough to shoot someone when they're very best, shoot them a double out box. <laughs> if if or, you can find slug. it, if you can find it, man, I, I've been just trying to get some some. I don't care if it's nine pellet flight control. If you guys know, did you can't even h- hardly find nine pellet flight control now. Hey, go with Vag. Then comp that barrel and uh, the other stuff is becomes okay all of a sudden. Ah, good point, buddy. <laughs> yeah, but I, I'm I'm sitting there. I I did get um a handful of the um of the nine pellet flight control, and uh, and I shoot. I'll embarrass myself if I um made a bad decision or not. But I did find at least some eight pellet Remington stuff. But is that any good? guys um if it's the eight pellet stuff that's their reduced recoil le load it comes the buffering material in it's like plastic discs that were look like they were done with a hole punch um and patterning it at least up close is really unique because of what the buffering material does to a paper target Hmm. um it's not bad if i can't get my preference is hornaday's load with the versatite um cup wad flight and control you said after that, that. I mean, yep. go ahead i'm sorry buddy flight control after that but i'll tell you the winchester le reduced recoil ranger double out buck load is not bad at all like if i couldn't find the other two i'd run that all day long see now see i talk, i'm glad i brought that up because now i've got some some other ammo i can look for cool 
Well, guys, you, you... Yeah, I'll just throw it there real quick. I had no expectations. Everything we buy is pretty much off federal purchase contracts. I didn't think I'd ever see flight control on there. So I had all my, uh, made sure all the guns that I'm responsible for were vanged. And uh, we generally run the, that Winchester Ranger, uh, generally the eight pellet. Uh, and what I had done was, as an administrator, I failed utterly because I sent all the barrels off and I actually had them marked with which guns they came off of. And I just put them right back on. I saw the groups that one of my guys' gun was shooting, and I'm like, I should have stolen that barrel right there. <laughs> I should have screened all the shotgun barrels when they came back because it was shooting, you know, that at 15 yards is our buckshot qual. Dude, it was, it was like the Vang system was like holding probably a six inch group. It was absolutely amazing. So I failed wow. utterly to cherry pick the best stuff for me. And I, I, I filed that away as future mistakes not to make. <laughs> you, you won't make it again. <laughs> no, I will not. Yeah, now I just need to get some some training from you guys. Well, well, listen, gentlemen, you you guys are a blessing to um, myself and and my brother, and you know, to folks out in the audience. So I really appreciate you guys uh, giving me and giving EOSEC your time. And um, so, thank you very much from the from the bottom of my heart. I appreciate it. So. With that said, gentlemen, I'm going to let you guys go. Um, you guys have a blessed evening. Um, I, I, again, really appreciate it. And you guys have a good one. We'll talk soon. Mm -hmm.